why is this pair of boots nearly 10 pounds and who even wears these things and why is there 60 spikes attached to the bottom of these boots? Well, we're gonna find out by cutting these in half and running through our test to really see why cork boots have basically remained unchanged for at least 200 years, if not more. And thanks to JK Boots for sponsoring this video. So the story of this boot basically starts with the beginning of the logging industry in the 1700s in the United States or soon to be United States because as soon as colonists came to the Americas, lumber was automatically one of the biggest natural resources and exports for the soon to be United States. And by 1790, the US was exporting 36 million feet of pine board and at least 300 ship masts per year to the British Empire, which made it one of the most important exports for the US economy. So logging has always been a part of the American spirit, even before there was the United States. And basically from day one, boot makers started making specialized boots for loggers. If you look at any of the old photos of loggers from the 1800s, they almost exclusively are wearing super high spiked boots with giant heels. And you compare those photos to this boot boot and they're almost identical. And these, those boots in those photos were 100 years old, over 100 year old, some, I don't, know, I don't know, it depends on when photography was invented. So when people call this style of boot heritage, that's what it really means. It's a true heritage. It's not like 30 years old, it's hundreds of years old for these styles and these patterns of boots. So what is this boot and why hasn't it changed in the last 200 years? Well, the brand is JK Boots. The style is just cork boots because I think they're a special order. They don't stock them on their site for sure. They weigh four and a half pounds each. And like I said, they, they're custom made boots. So I have no idea how much they cost because they're custom. But to put it in perspective, most of the regular boots are 600 bucks plus, and you can imagine how much more this would cost. And they're made in the United States in Spokane, Washington. And if you want more of a tame version of this boot, check out the links in the description of some of the videos we've done for more of an everyday boot. So now to the actual design of this boot, and why does this boot have half an inch of leather around your foot at certain points, like right here at this lineman patch? Because loggers need protection from the harsh wilderness. And keep in mind, these aren't the groomed trails we see today. These are the untouched, untamed, Pacific Northwest overgrowth from 100 plus years ago. So you need that stability, you need that protection of essentially a somewhat flexible cast around your foot. And that's also why they make them so high for the support and for any gaps that you have, happen to be putting on. And so what is this leather? Well, this is from the Seidel Tannery in Milwaukee. They're known worldwide for making some of the toughest leather in the entire world. And it's a ridiculous thickness. It's 3.5 millimeters thick with just the leather. And with the lining on the inside, that's like more of a fabric insulated liner, it's five millimeters thick. And to show you how strong this actually is, it took a 196.5 pounds to puncture through just the upper, obviously with the lining on the inside. But that's just one layer of leather that took nearly 200 pounds, and that's the highest score we've ever done on the puncture test. So you can see why multiple layers of this leather become quite impenetrable for literally any situation. And did they have this thick of leather back in the day? It's really hard to tell. I'm sure it was within the same range of thickness. I don't know if it was quite as thick. So maybe we'll try to find a pair of really old logger boots. So if you have a pair or have access to a pair, hit me up. But now to one of the bigger questions people always have about this style of boot, why such a big hill? Because it's not just this style of boot, it's all these logger boots, especially from the Pacific Northwest, even back to 200 years ago, had really tall heels. And it's not like it's just for style. Imagine, you know, this uh, gold rush era loggers, they're not walking around caring about style. And we covered this a lot more uh, thoroughly in the other JK boot video, so go watch that. But the, the short version of it is to build up the arch support under your foot and to elevate your heel for hiking and to keep you out of the muck. But why was arch support so vital for loggers? Well, they're on their feet all day carrying heavy equipment and the arch support not only supports the arch to prevent it from collapsing, but it kind of distributes the weight across more of your foot because instead of all that weight being flat on your heel, it being elevated pushes some of the weight more forward on the ball of your foot instead of all sitting on the heels of your foot. And speaking of heel bones, if you ever wondered why they're called corks, it's not probably what you think because it comes from the Latin word calcanium, calcaneus, which means heel bone. And it slowly just went from like calcanium, calx, cox, cox, corks, fun little bit. And there's plenty of arguments and counter arguments for arch support, zero drop, all this stuff, but there's ultimately no denying that the Pacific Northwest style has by far the highest and largest arch support out of any boot we've cut apart. Just look at this JK boot that we've cut apart previously compared to a Thoroughgood. It's quite a bit of difference, but it wasn't just the landscape that was tough on the loggers, it was also soaking wet because the Pacific Northwest is basically a rainforest. I think it's categorized as a rainforest. And with constant rainy conditions and very unstable muddy terrain, you can imagine how clogged up your boots would be with mud. But that was nothing compared to the endless felled trees and logs all over the ground that are constantly walking on and walking through. And if you've ever done any kind of forestry work or logging or wildland work, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It just takes one slip on a dry log and you can easily break your leg. It happens to hunters more than you'd probably think. And so they had to be able to grip those logs to prevent them from slipping off, breaking a leg, and especially in the 
backcountry in the Pacific Northwest where no one's gonna save you. But logs on the ground, even that's nothing compared to a log jam. Cause you've probably seen pictures and videos of this where one slip didn't just mean a broken leg, it meant certain death. Because sawmills are usually water powered so they're right next to the river. And so the easiest way to get thousands and thousands of logs to a, a sawmill is just float them on down the river. But the problem with that is you clog up a river almost instantly. And so you need people along the river, guiding the logs through, making sure they don't get stuck with these giant log jams. So now imagine a river literally full of logs and you're standing on one log, helping guide them through. And if you slip, it's not that you just fall in the water because you fall between two logs. And as you fall into the water, those logs close up around you because it's a whole river's packed with them. So you're under the water in five pound boots with thousands of logs covering you. There's just no escape. And that's why it's one of the most dangerous jobs of all time. Because back hundreds of years ago, it wasn't like they had these fancy spikes on the bottom. They literally just took nails and drove them through the inside to poke out the bottom so they got more grip. And one thing I really like about these, they're about as function based as you can get. Because these spikes, they're not permanent. You can actually undo them and put new spikes in along with this little toe bumper. I just want to put that on every one of my boots because it's cool. Because the way this is made, there's two layers of a rubber midsole and they sandwich in between a T-nut that has little teeth in it so it prevents it from spinning. And then these are basically little screws that are really spiky and you screw them in, tighten them down. So that anytime you wear them out, you just throw some new ones in there and you're not out a very expensive pair of boots. It kind of reminds me of a tool in the same way that like a backhoe, you don't throw away the entire backhoe when you wear out the teeth, you just replace the teeth. Similar concept here, because this is so durable and so strong, you're gonna wear these spikes out way faster than you're gonna wear out the boot. And to put that in perspective, we've never really had a boot that we couldn't puncture through the outsole into the inside of the boot. And this was the first one that we just could not get through. It, it maxed out the scale and was bending the nail. And so that's how impenetrable they are. So now that you know about this boot and how the spikes work, let's cut these things in half. And at the end of this video, we'll see what these spikes can really do when we really put them to the test. And we'll see if the inside of this boot is even more beefy and built up than JK's regular boots. Okay, live reaction this time. Let's see what's inside. Ooh, we actually got it perfect. We can see right through some of the spikes and they're hot as shit. Dang, that was perfect. You can get some of the nails too. Yeah, and you can see like this one that's basically cut in half. Turned out so 
Okay. This is one of the cooler cut in halves that we've had because you can see the cross section of, of these little T nuts and the spikes and how they go in. We had we literally cut one of these little spikes in half. You can see how it's threaded over here. And just look at the massive amount of leather all the way through. Is it any different than their regular boots? Surprisingly not. You know, it's got a little bit more in the heel stack. And that's that's the cool thing about these boots is like these are purpose built a piece of equipment and their regular working boots are basically built the same way from the sole down. Something that is kind of crazy is we, now we can get the caliper in on this lineman pad and the vamp and the quarter this the thickest and most protective part of the upper of the boot it's almost half an inch thick of just leather and that's why people love these Pacific Northwest boots because they just they're a purpose-built piece of equipment that you can wear every day and work in every day and rely on them for years at a time so now why is this pair of boots nearly 10 pounds well it's because you're fighting the green inferno the Pacific Northwest and you need as much grip and as much protection as you can get in a pair of boots and still be wearable and that's what's cool about this style of boot is it's it's that perfect intersection of like any more it's wearable and any less you don't have the same protection and finally why has this style of boot basically remained unchanged for over 200 years to me it's it's just a common case if it ain't broke don't fix it there's a reason why they've remained unchanged and that's because it didn't need to be changed and the little bits that definitely need to be changed like instead of driving nails through the sole you'd have these little spikes that got changed but the actual structure of the boot and the functionality of it has basically remained the same and it just kind of blows me away how heritage, heritage boots really are. Because there's not many things in this world that have re remained unchanged for hundreds of years. Especially something that you use every day that's so much a part of just human culture generally. It's a style of boot that helped build America and is continuing to help build America even 200 plus years later. So let me know what you think. And if you have any additional information on this subject, put it in the comments because it's really tough to do real research on this particular thing. Who's documenting cork boots from the 1800s? Nobody. So thank you guys for all your support and check out JK Boots via the link in my description. So thank you guys. See ya.